The University of Madras is one of the oldest universities in India. Established in the middle of the 19th century, it has become a place of higher learning which is prominent all over South Asia. It is a place of higher learning which includes the Department of Philosophy. It includes a manuscript library of Sanskrit handwritten manuscripts, including texts of the Bhagavata Purana. Here we are holding part of our conference on the Bhagavata Purana, hosted by the philosophy department, which has a tradition of study both of modern philosophy and ancient philosophy. Including within our abridged Bhagavatam, mm. uh, a section of the Rasalila yes. portion. Yes. Uh, you know, we decided we're not going to include anything because you had already done the whole thing. Right, right. We didn't want to seem like we're competing. Well, yes, yes. <laughs> uh, but you anyway. See, but you see, you know why? Because oh, I felt I you, you both had done a, a beautiful job um, extracting the jewels from the rest of the text. Right. How could you not have the ultimate jewel exactly. acknowledged there and no, envisioned you, there? You so completely persuaded us. I really felt it would complete your work. So you finished, of course, years ago, your uh, translation, and you've been doing some other things, but you're still somehow doing things with the Bhagavatam. Yes. What's this? See, but that's, that's the miracle of the Bhagavatam. It's an endless wellspring of inspiration and scholarship, as well as it has been so for the Hindu tradition. Mm -hmm. It's really amazing. There's a story in the Bhagavata for every person. So, Professor Schweig, we're so happy that you've come to this conference here in Chennai knowing that you're uh, one of the scholars most qualified to participate uh, because of your extensive study of the Bhagavata Purana. You've been not just studying the Bhagavata, you've been translating the Bhagavata. Uh, and I want to first ask a basic question and then we'll move into your translation. Uh, what is it that's so special about the Bhagavata that makes it interesting for people today. The Bhagavata has earned the ge general characteristic of a classic. And a classic always withstands the test of time. And even today, it seems to attract readers in a way that many, many works throughout history just don't. And I think part of the reason for that is it is an extremely variegated text. It is, an, uh, literarily speaking, it's very rich, it's very beautiful, and theologically, it's very, very deep. So I think in these ways, it speaks to people now. And it, uh, and, is, and for the West, it's sort of a refreshing book. It's a new angle on things especially as the world has grown smaller and smaller. We're more aware of other cultures, other viewpoints, other perspectives. And the Bhagavata offers an extraordinarily rich perspective. Hmm. You have especially focused on one particular portion of the Bhagavata, uh, known as the Rasa Liva, the yes. dance, Krishna's divine dance. And you have translated the five chapters that deal with the subject. And you have also written about how the notion of the circle dance as a mandala, mandala is a Sanskrit word meaning circle, uh, is so crucial to the structure of the entire work. Could you say something about that? Yes. Well, first of all, I should tell you that I never intended to write a dissertation uh, or undergo a dissertation project uh, on the Bhagavata. This was something that 
my dissertation advisor guided me to. And the reason for this was that even though I, my degree is in comparative religion from Harvard, and normally one would have done a comparative dissertation, but the reason he guided me to the Bhagavata is because he said that we need to prepare scholarship on the Bhagavata for comparative work because it's lacking the attention that it deserves and needs. Hmm. So this was back in 1990. And of course, I'm delighted to see the kind of work that you and Ravi Gupta are doing on the Bhagavata, really expanding the studies. But back then, really, there wasn't much done. So I was directed to, uh, to the Bhagavata to look at its theologically valuable facets to a particular tradition in India, known as the Chaitanya or Gaudiya Vaishnava tradition. And this tradition always has valued this particular five chapters, five sequential chapters in the tenth book as being the highest episode, the highest Leela story, divine act. And what's interesting about this is that I mean, the Bhagavata is a very vast text. There are 335 chapters. There are 12 books. And it's um, at least 14,000 verses long. Some people count it, depending on how you divide up the verses, it can be 18,000. But 14,000 would even be long enough. So it's a very complex text. So I had known that the Chaitanya school of Vaishnavism in India has valued this five chapters around the sort of first third of the 90 chapter book, the tenth, uh, the, the tenth part, as the sort of quintessential text of the whole piece of literature. But what I sought to do is to see if the Bhagavata itself says that it is the most important part of the whole text. And I was really surprised. I thought maybe the tradition was sort of uh, bringing it out and saying this is the most important text, Mm -hmm. much the way that Christian and Jewish mystics bring out the Song of Solomon Mm -hmm. as the Song of Songs, the Holy of Holies. Mm -hmm. But there's no indication in the rest of the Bible that the Song of Songs is the most important text. Mm -hmm. But in the Bhagavata, a very very unitary text in many ways, really has things that point to the Ras Lila ever so often throughout the text. And beyond the Ras Lila chapters, points back to it. When you say Ras Lila, what do you mean? Okay, so I'm referring to those five chapters of the 10th book, chapters 29 through 33. Mm. They're typically known as the Rasa Lila. That is to say, well, I translated it in my, in, uh, as a title for my book as Dance of Divine Love. Mm. But more literally, it means the Lila or the divine play of the Rasa dance. Mm-hmm. And so it is an episode, it's five chapters, which I discovered take the form of fine classical Sanskrit drama. Mm. So I even call each chapter an act. And my book extensively looks at all of that. And, uh, and of course, has a lot of critical apparatus. It will be republished in a smaller, more readable edition for uh, the uh, greater uh, uh, readership out there. But, but the idea is that this, this episode, this five chapter uh, story, indeed is the focal point, sort of the ultimate point of the whole Bhagavata. Mm. And the Chaitanya uh, 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 theologians pointed this out, calling it the Lila Sara, the essence of all Lilas, or the Sarva Lila Chudamani, the crown jewel of all (laughs) Lilas. So, I mean, they're very dramatic about it, but I wanted to see if the Bhagavata really also honors that as as the sort of uh, uh, passage, and it does. You have mentioned to me a few minutes ago before we came on camera yeah. that one scholar has identified 
these five chapters in a special way mm. as uh, if you can quote him yeah. and tell us who that is. Yeah. Well, um, uh, Daniel H. H. Ingalls of Harvard University, he was my Sanskrit professor. And every so often he would invite the Sanskrit students over to his apartment on Memorial Drive, which runs right along the edge of the Charles River, which is the beginning of where Harvard uh, uh, begins, the, the main campus. <clears throat> the business school is on the other side of the river, but we don't count that, those of us in humanities. Right. But the idea is that I went over to his house, and he was one of the foremost, really, Indologists of the 20th century. And he read Sanskrit fluently. He also read in um, several other languages, poetry, Persian, Greek, Latin, and so on. And upon reading the 10th book, he said something that you wouldn't expect from a scholar. He said that the 10th book, especially the Ras Lila passage, which I heard in, in, in his apartment, is the most enchanting poem ever written. Mm. Now those are rather strong words, and I'm not sure that we scholars ever make such absolutistic statements, but he did, which is unusual for him. And I think he was so enthralled with the beauty of the poetry, mm. and it really is some of the most exquisite poetry of the world, no, no doubt. Mm. Now, encountering such beautiful poetry, there's, if you, if you think you're going to translate that, you find you have many challenges. Oh my gosh, yes. And you have translated these five chapters. Yes. And you have told me the very first verse yes. of these, how many verses altogether? 100, 173. 173 mm -hmm. verses. Just that one verse took you that you translated and retranslated yes. almost 50 <coughs> times. Yes. Could yes. you share with us that verse which, with your final translation? Well, let's see if I can recall it. The verses of the, of the Ras Lila in general are the, 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 the depth of metaphor and the richness and resonances, uh, the theological resonances in this text are so deep that anyone who attempts to translate the Ras Lila passages is either very courageous or a fool. And uh, I'm, I'm not sure how, what percentage I am of fit. either, exactly. <laughs> However, I spent a lot of time, on just 173 verses, I spent years. And I would consult the commentaries, and I would move into a way of trying to translate that would afford the English-speaking reader a real sense of the way it feels and, and, um, and moves in the original Sanskrit. So that was, that's very hard. Most Sanskritists don't even go for that. They just try to get it out in a prose translation. Yeah. But to put it out in a poetic translation is very difficult. So that first verse, um, let's see if I can recall it. Bhagavan Apitaratri Sharadot Pulla Malika Viksharantum Manas Chakre Yogamayam Upashrita. Even the beloved Lord during those autumn nights, uh, uh, during those nights in autumn with blooming jasmine flowers, m turned his mind toward love's delights, taking refuge fully in Yogamaya's creative powers. There's a lot that can be said here. Now, one thing that occurs in fine Sanskrit poetry mm. is that the first verse is front-loading the whole of the text, like an, like an oak tree is contained in an acorn. Right. So the major components, the four major components, are in the first verse. Huh. But one of them is hidden. Oh, okay. First, the announcement of Bhagavan, Sri Krishna. Mm. Second, the beauteous paradisal scenery of Raja, the place where this takes place. Third, the 
power, the, the creative power of yoga maya. Now that's sort of like, uh, you could say, a divine director of a drama. Mm. An invisible power that allows the actors to lose themselves in the play. That's what yoga maya is. Maya means power, and yoga means union. The power to bring the actors together mm. in this drama. But the main heroines are not so obviously present in this mm. verse. Well, as it turns out, that the word Ratri is the name for the Vedic goddess of the night. Mm. And here, the Raja Gopikas, the coward maidens, become goddesses of the night because they leave their homes at night to go out into the forest to enter this eternal dance of divine love with Krishna. But not only are they night goddesses, but there's something extraordinary happening here in the fact that jasmine, first of all, is blooming at night. Second of all, it's blooming in the autumn, and neither normally happens. It blooms in the spring, and maybe the summer, mostly in the spring. So this is a metaphor that lets us know that something extraordinary and strange and magical, magical, exactly, yeah. is, is happening. So, I mean, and I could go on for hours, and right. I know you're not wanting me to do that, <laughs> but the, the, the metaphorical complexity is so rich yeah. that I can show you how the acorn contains the oak tree mm. in this verse. Wonderful. Thank you. Now, you mentioned that this dance yeah. is understood to be going on without end, yeah. suggesting that as we speak, it is taking place. Is yes. that the understanding? You can't see it right now. <laughs> it is taking place. Now, the, to, to the tradition, it is something that is eternal. And this eternality is represented, as you spoke of earlier, by mandala. A circle is known in so many cultures as the great symbol of eternality. Mm. Because there's no beginning. You can't point to any beginning of the circle or any end. And yet, it does take place in a, in a drama. Yes. You know, it it, it is only sequence. occurs at the end in the fifth chapter, mm. which is the climactic event of the whole, epi of the whole drama. Mm. But it, 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 it is known to cycle around and happen every night, eternally. And this, for the uh, Chaitanya school, is the great symbol of entering uh, the dance of divine love with God. Mm that here, the, in the final you know, ends of all things, the soul is released into a divine dance of love. It's an extremely positive, joyous occasion. And Krishna, as the deity, he is known as supremely beautiful, supremely playful, and supremely delightful. Hmm. And that uh, you know, lets you know how the uh, uh, persons who take up this uh, leela as an ultimate vision, how they perceive it as something so attractive. And presumably the Bhagavata as a whole, which of course is the king, Parikshit, preparing for death, yes. hearing from Shuka, he it presumably in the twelfth book is entering into that divine dance, although yes. it doesn't seem to say that explicitly. Right. And then the reader, when he comes to the end of book 12, what does he or she do? She goes back to the beginning of the text, the first verse of the first book, isn't right. it? Yes. And in this way, the circle it, it's cyclical. continues. It's cyclical. Right. And, and, and then so is the Ras Leela. The five chapters are cyclical. The, 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 the end, the Raja Gopikas, the coward maidens go home, but they come back the next night. Ah. So it's the eternal night. Mm. So it's a cycle within a cycle within a cycle. And they're, you know, uh, uh, the telescoping narratives. So it's a very rich, very complex book. And I think that's why the text is attracting more and more scholarship by scholars such as yourself. And, and uh, this conference, this wonderful conference that we're we're attending. And attracting scholars not just of India, not just of America, but also of China, of Europe, yeah. 
Japan. It's remarkable. So we have them all. It is quite remarkable. The two dialogue persons of the Bhagavatam, the king, Parikshit, and the sage, Shuka, are speaking throughout the text. In what way does the Bhagavata encourage the reader or the listener to identify with the king, who we understand is about to die? Yes, it is a um, fascinating story, but the, the ultimate thing I think that the reader begins to identify with is, is this journey we call life, and mortality is still 100% as, as far as I know, and death becomes the big question. So this is a text that deals with you know, ultimate things, and the ultimate event of everyone's life is death. So here's a king who in some sense sits in for the rest of us. And the big question, of course, is what does one do to prepare for death? How should one prepare for death? But you know, what's interesting to me about the Bhagavata is that as you read along, you get so absorbed in these kinds of uh, uh, other realms, these, these alaukika realms, uh, otherworldly realms, that in one sense, you've already been taken beyond death. And by the time you get to the Ras Lila, you've already walked through that door of death. And death, in some sense, has been uh, dismantled. Death is just merely a doorway. So the self can contain so much of the love and affection for divinity. Right now, the body becomes an impediment. And the Chaitanya school expresses this, I think, really well. But that the, the body becomes an impediment as one fills one's life with so much love for the divine that uh, one welcomes the day when one can burst out of the cage and into the Ras Lila, the ultimate event. Right. And at the end of the text, we understand the king doesn't actually die. Right. Can you explain that? Well, again, theologically, um, death means, uh, to, you know, it doesn't mean that you die. Death means you enter a different state. At least this is the Bhagavata's understanding, that we, the soul is eternal, the self is eternal, and it can be liberated into eternal, the most beautiful, playful, and delightful realms. And this is, uh, I think, the, the, um, the very attractive aspect of the Bhagavata, that it really presents this very fresh sort of uh, realm where there isn't uh, a, a, a god of judgment. There isn't a, a god of condemnation. There isn't a god of, uh, of, um, uh, that, that, that uh, sees humans as defective beings. But it, Ultimately, there's a perfect self in there that needs to find a place of perfection. And this is where the Bhagavata goes. So would you say this is where we get the sense of the Bhagavata's uh, presentation of yoga? Yes. Yoga really is about the uniting of the true self with a perfect realm. And that is what's practiced in yoga meditation, is to go deep within and to find the divine. That is the ultimate part of yoga, in Patanjala yoga, in Bhagavad Gita, and in the Bhagavata. They all, they all agree with this. Thank you so much, Professor Schweig. Thank you, happy to be here.